Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's event. Uh, my name is Tucker. I work at uh, Cost Tailored. Um, I work in the office of the general manager. And uh, sometimes I like to put on fun events to uh, teach the community about something awesome that's going on that we, we've been a, either a part of or have seen. Um, in this case, it's both. So today we're going to showcase uh, something that the Nordstrom AP team has been uh, working on over the last uh, few months, in about a year, um, to kind of show some of the improvements that they've done by just implementing flow principles in their work. Uh, we picked this one because it's uh, there's some clear uh, changes, but also because lean and continuous improvement kind of is sometimes seen as a manufacturing thing, whereas this is really showing that it's anything that's a process can either be, you know, worked in flow. Or, or not, and it, it's kind of cool to show that. Um, so a little bit about us, since we have so many new people um, that don't know about us, maybe. Uh, this might be your first experience with us. Um, so uh, Truth But Poll uh, is our consulting agency. We exist to help people experience joy at work. So that's um, just the simplest way we can put it, is that's, that's kind of our goal, is to help people find ways to do, um, do the work with joy and have some fun, have it feel a little bit more like hobby. And so CostPass is something we launched in 2021 as a way to create this global community that offers insider access to our events, uh, our training, behind the scene experiences, our, our uh, gong show sometimes, uh, to be able to experience what life is like working within these principles. And so uh, Nordstrom's controller organization was actually one of our launch cl uh, clients with CostPass and they've been applying flow principles to, to a lot of their processes. The cool part is that it's not just from the top, though it includes the top of the controller org, it's also um, leaders and individual contributors throughout the org saying, yeah, let's make this flow better and, and live with less waste and less problems. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our panelists. So Liz and, and uh, John and Sebastian, if you guys could introduce yourself, maybe um, your, your, uh, your name, your role within Nordstrom, and uh, what's your hobby? Like, what do you enjoy doing with your free time? So. Uh, go, let's start with Liz. Okay. Hi. Thanks, Tucker. Um, my name is Liz Harmonies. I'm an AP manager on the accounts payable team at Nordstrom. Um, and a hobby of mine would be baking. So cakes, cookies, um, you know, trying new decorations and things like that for baked goods. So. Uh, my name is John. I'm on the accounts payable team as an accounting assistant. And I would say my big hobby lately is video game programming, learning how to use Unreal Engine. It's pretty fun. Um, how about you, Sebastian? Hi, everybody. I'm Sebastian. I'm also on the accounts payable team as an assistant accountant. A uh, hobby of mine, I enjoy reading and writing. So often I'll read something and be like, how can I write this in a similar way? <laughs> so thank you. There you go. Maybe you guys can combine your two hobbies and you can do the writing and then we can develop a game with John. I think we have a logical pairing here. Um, really cool. Well, um, Liz, why don't you uh, go ahead and share your screen? Uh, if you should be able to do that. Let me just, yep, you should, you're, you're enabled. Um, tell us a little bit about your team and really your role within Nordstrom. What do you guys do? Um, so the team, what is, you know, what is this accounts payable side of the business do? Um, we focus on accurate entry of the hard copy invoices, so items we're not receiving um, electronically, so that's 1% of our invoices. Um, now, we receive 99% electronically, but that means that, you know, these are all manually entered. Um, we focus on return to vendor payment emails, vendor portal accesses, um, we assist with vendor emails and related to payments and chargeback inquiries. And then we assist with manual invoice processing. Awesome, really cool. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit about how the previous, pro how your process worked when you first maybe went on this journey. Um, really paint that picture of the brokenness that was your process. Um, so we really get a, uh, an understanding of the current condition when you first started improving things. Yeah, so um, how it started was, we looked at it, we looked at processes that we wanted to tackle first and decided that this one would be a good candidate because everyone on the team knows how to key. 
Um, when we looked at it, we evaluated how we did the process and noticed we had many folders we were dropping emails in, so 10 plus. Um, we were frequently utilizing something we call surge resources. So um, we had people that focused on this process, but we frequently had to ask others to help. It was exceeding what our capacity was. Um, we aimed for a five-day SLA service level agreement, um, but we're frequently noticing it was going beyond that. Um, when there was missing information on invoices, when looking at it, folks were approaching it differently. Different messages were going out. Um, so we saw that as an opportunity. Um, there were a high volume of defects from suppliers. Um, defects included uh, missing PO number, missing invoice number. Um, the keyer was seeing that. So, you know, we would receive the email. It would get sorted based on the attachment into one of the many folders that it could be dropped in. Um, the keyer would then try to key it. It would either get keyed um, or not keyed. And if it wasn't keyed, it would get placed in a questions folder. Um, from there, it would get researched and then either still not keyed, it was evaluated that it wasn't a keyable item, maybe it wasn't even an invoice. Um, and then if it was keyable, it would get returned to the keyer to key. Um, but we were finding that this was extending our SLA um, from one to, you know, seven to 10 days. Wow. Okay. So, and uh, how did you know it was broken? Obviously that that's kind of staggering data, but how did, I can maybe, maybe get into the feelings of things. So how did it feel? How did, uh, before you made any improvements, just how did it feel? Paint a picture for us, please. Yeah, um, I think when we talked about it as a team, we all met and talked about, you know, what does this process look like? Um, and then when I asked the team to mark, you know, what would you improve first? We put these red sticky notes based on what we had um, learned from CostPass and observed. And then everyone put, there's a lot of defects when keying. There's a lot of noise there. It's really frustrating. Um, you know, I, I don't know why it's coming to me if I can't key it. That's what we were hearing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anyone on this call uh, enjoys, or anyone, period, enjoys getting defective work, right? Where it's it's not caught up upstream and then you're having to troubleshoot it, uh, you know, do something to it, send it back. Maybe it waits there. You know, it doesn't. it's not good for the customer as well. So um, really neat. Okay. So that's before the before flow. What uh, does the process look like now? What, what did you guys put in place? Yeah. Um, okay, so changes we implemented. Um, so after looking at the process, getting it mapped, um, we focused on the biggest pain point that the, te the team was experiencing and sharing. And so that was the defects. So just looking at that, what ideas does the team have that could help alleviate that frustrated feeling? Um, so when we look at that, we decided rearranging the work was necessary. That, you know, maybe the invoice questions, the questions shouldn't be at the end. Um, we created multiple decision trees um, for clear role res and responsibilities. Um, we found that the different areas were using kind of different language when they'd ask questions and things. So creating that common language in the seats. Um, we have a few systems that we look up information or input or research. And so we looked at and created, you know, three seats and looked at which tools were best in each seat and if every seat needed a that tool. And it was determined you know, the keyer doesn't need to go into all these other seats. They only need our invoice entry system, for example. Um, created clear handoffs for each seat. And then as we dove into the process, we worked on creating a consistent standard of work. What does it look like in each of these seats? So um, to walk you through it, we still receive the email the same way. Um, the team has a set time they meet at. Um, they have a seat one, which we call a gatekeeper. They use a decision tree to um, decide how to work that email. Um, so it's much more clear, very important to us. 
Um, and then from there, it gets moved to the sorter. If it's deemed okay, has an invoice, those sort of things, checkbox items. Um, and they also have a decision tree that they use to help make a decision on it. Um, and then it gets sorted into the folders call this seat two sorter. And then from there, if it's looking good to key, um, it gets moved to the keyer. The keyer uses one system um, and they're, you know, they feel less defects, less movement, less waiting, um, and yeah. Really cool. And, and so obviously this is uh, after several experiments and uh, a period of time where you're trying things and stabilizing all that. What were some early experiments? Like, what were the first few steps you took after, you know, identifying the problem and getting, you know, I know you came to our, um, we'll get into like how you like got the training. We can do that later. But in terms of like the experiments that you guys tried, what were some steps you tried first? Yeah. Um, I think some of the items that stood out were when we observe some of the cost pass stuff, it's like, how do we, how does the work flow where where should these seats live and so we experimented we didn't call them you know gatekeeper and sorter off the bat necessarily um we you know we had some other names for them and then it made sense like this person is the first in the line they look at those emails they're going to be gatekeeper another group um in ours uses that term too so we're like great let's be consistent and use that um and then we didn't have the decision tree right off the bat it was okay, well, we have kind of rules. Well, now how do we organize them? So I would say the first experiment was implementing the decision tree. And now that's been a really iterative process. We've made numerous changes. Um, the, you know, the team as they're working it has come up with changes or if they've seen certain types of emails. Um, and I would say that's, it's still ongoing, but that was definitely one of the first experiments is implementing the decision trees um, by just looking at and saying, are you guys, when you guys work these, do you use all these folders? What's going into the folders? You know, is there any that we just have there and we never touch or are we using them for the same thing? So I'd say that was one of the experiments was looking at the folders folks were putting items in um, and making sure they made sense. You know, how long have they been there? It could be, you know, a while. Um, and then another one was the systems. So, we did make some changes, but we started and said, um, we think this gatekeeper seat, for example, seat one is going to need these systems based on this decision tree. We think sorting is going to need these systems and, you know, less systems you're navigating in, less screens focuses your attention on certain items. Um, and that's, that's evolved. It's definitely been updated um, throughout the, since we started this process. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, I love the iteration, right? Experiment, try, learn. You, you'll run into, especially with, you know, email gatekeeping, I'm sure you ran into exceptions where it's like, I, this doesn't fit anything. We got to figure that out, right? Really cool. One of the questions in the chat from Alyssa, um, I think is worth asking. I think maybe this is where we can start involving John and uh, Sebastian as well. For you guys, for John and Sebastian, how was the morale on the team and, uh, you know, for you individually, prior to any improvement and then compare that to now. Let's see what the contrast is on the on the emotional front or the, the person front. Uh, sure, so uh, prior to implementing this new flow, Sebastian and I were only working on the team for about a, a month. So we were pretty new to the whole system, um, but even in that time, we could feel a little, um, it was a little bit overwhelming sometimes the amount of defects that we would get. But within the first week of implementing our new system, those defects were almost, I won't say entirely gone, but they were gone to such a degree that we could feel immediately better about the work that we were doing. Really cool. Sebastian, anything, anything to add? Yeah, uh, echoing John a bit here too, but uh, definitely the older process allowed more defects to get through to the keyer, which was always a bit of a pain point because you wouldn't necessarily know there was a defect in the invoice until you went to finalize it. So you, that work would just be gone. Um, and as soon as the process changed, that pain point had shifted entirely for the most part. There, sometimes things yeah. still happen, but. Sure, it still worked, but <laughs> a little bit more hobby. Really cool. Um, uh, anything, any, anything from your perspective, Liz, to add in, on term, in terms of what you noticed for your team, the morale of the team, because you were here before, you know, longer than Sebastian and John. Do you have anything to add about the emotion side? 
Yeah. Um, I noticed there was just frustration, you know, like we're getting all these invoices. We can't keep up with the volume. Um, or if we do, you know, it takes a lot of folks, people have to pivot and move on and help. And the team was very willing to help when needed, but they have other stuff on their desk. So it was like, Hey, I have to shift items. I have to, you know, I have to jump in, which is, you know, teamwork and all of it, which was really great to see, but then updating it, it definitely helped and it helped people balance their desks too. Really cool. Awesome. Um, okay. Moving on to uh, my next question. How do you know it is better? So it feels better. That's great. I love that. We want that. We want our teams to feel better. But let's translate it into some actual, some, some data, some, some, somewhere that we could know like, oh, this is objectively better. So what were the results? Yeah, so let's talk about the results and reflect on um, what we've accomplished. Um, so in the first three months, we saw an increase in productivity. So our total end-to-end -end process increased over 500%. End-to-end um, -end meaning when the email came in to when it was keyed. You know, when that email was completed, check, done. Um, huge strides, huge increases, which also flowed into an increase in manually keyed invoices per hour. So increased over 300%. So we were seeing folks normally key around 11 invoices per hour. Um, on average now, they key 45. Um, and then when I started time tracking, something that I learned at the cost pass and really emphasizing that, like you got to track where you start, um, I noticed that the process was taking over a hundred hours. I was like, that's really interesting. Very enlightening for myself to see. Like I knew it took time, but to actually see like, okay, how many people on average, what does it take? And now when I track it, it's taking about 20 hours. So, and that's per week. So that's a huge decrease, 80%. Um, you know, I talked about it, but we reduced the folder count you know, up to about five folders now from over 10. Um, we reduced the SLA. So it was aiming for five days. I did share, you know, it did go over five. We're responding and getting emails back to vendors faster, providing better customer service. We're getting them back in one day. So a vendor is hearing from us that much sooner and hearing if we, if we need more information to enter their invoice. Um, we're more agile, the process, we can make changes, um, we can try experiments, which is great. The team comes, you know, to our huddles and says, hey, I think we should update this. Hey, I, up I observed this. I, I got this type of email. I'm wondering if we should add it to the decision tree. So a lot of great suggestions and thinking there. Um, and as, you know, John and Sebastian shared, there's just less defects and less waste. Yeah, really cool. And what I love about this is you weren't trying to just go at it and try to remove waste. Like that wasn't necessarily your, your motivation. It was, let's improve this flow. It's clearly not working. As you can see by the numbers, you know, imagine for anyone in supply chain, imagine, you know, you are working with this customer and, and it's, there's a huge delay in e even just a response to know like what's going on. Um, whereas now it's, it's very quick. You said same day, that's, in, that's incredible. Um, really cool. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the questions that is in the chat that I think is applicable here, Ashley is asking, with such large results, what did the team do to repurpose that time? So, you know, that going from 100 hours to, to 20 hours, that's a uh, pretty easy math, right? Um, to see we have some extra time on our hands. So what do you do with that? Yeah, great question. Um, so they are cross-training on other tasks now or we're able to help other teams more with their stuff, um, you know, when needed or able to help with um, items that just come through that aren't expected, that aren't part of our daily desk duties. Um, so we've been able to shift people in that time that they would have spent there to other items on the team. And so, you know, we're all, it's also helping in relation to this, helping our, you know, SLA, but it's helped other areas get our SLA down too. So it's it's been great in that feeling. And then the team can also focus on um, what other projects they wanna learn about and expand their skill set. Um, and then also continually looking at what other lean items should we look at or our next project too, related to lean and continuous improvement. Really cool, really cool. Um, and then 
let's let's go to my, uh, my next question, which is like, what training or you know basic training did your team get to know to do this? Because I, I I know the answer to this in terms of uh, you know you didn't have necessarily the training when you first started, but I'd love to hear maybe what are some things that you some experiences you guys did as a team that helped kind of develop this. Yeah. So, you know, we joined Cost Pass. Some of us have been in person and some folks are only virtual too. So an, it's a varying um, level of what was attended, but, you know, we looked at the lean concepts and sat through um, some trainings from Cost Pass for that and really emphasizing the seven wastes. Um, we went on a waste tour, um, multiples and in person or virtually. Um, they did the pipe simulation. So we did that in person um, and it really made us feel the frustration in person and just physically feeling it. So that was great. Um, the alphabet soup that Cost Pass has offered, um, a couple of us did it in person and uh, from personal experience, it just made you feel a certain way, you know, and really emphasized the point, I guess, of it. But then a number of folks also attended virtually and got to observe or participate as well. Um, and that's really valuable, just simulating how, um, you know, you just see stuff and your brain wants to do certain things, but how do you get to that end result? Um, and then people attended something they call the pressure cooker. So really emphasizing looking at like fat versus bitch and a bit, and then how can we apply it to what we're doing? And so that's, that's where we liked observing the order entry flow um, that they did. So some of us did it in person. Some of us have also done it virtually um, and watching them do that and then us saying okay well we watched this what did we see how can we apply it to our work you know if we is it you know something we're you know mirrored or is it hey we need to make a slight adjustment and then um taking a look at that and brainstorming so those were all really helpful and valuable to the team yeah and uh some of you may notice that there's like four kelly johnsons running around the zoom room uh that's all uh people the, it's our account management team that run an order entry flow line throughout. Um, the, we do that every day, so that's that's what that is. Um, and it was really cool because that I think gives a good framework for hey, this is you know not just production. We actually enter our orders or do accounts receivable or planning functions within our flow line. So it's really cool to see you guys take it to AP. And now it's great because actually um, one of our colleagues, Nick, who's on the call as well. He's actually been tasked with how do we do accounts payable in flow as well because we're not currently doing that it's, it's not where it needs to be so uh, really cool um, what, last question I have for you uh, what are some key takeaways uh, from going to flow so it's maybe like if you to boil it down to a few things what are those yeah um, so some key takeaways would uh, mentioned it a little earlier but we've created capacity to invest in lean projects um, it helps build the team morale and bringing joy to their work, which, you know, John and Sebastian lightly touched on. Um, the team is more aware and adaptable to incoming volume and process updates. We hear it more real time. Um, they are on a call together. They make call outs to each other during that time, um, during that set up meeting time. Um, they have real time, you know, Res resolutions because they can talk to each other, um, which they, if they have questions too, it's not going to this questions folder and sitting there. It's, hey guys, I see this. I think I'm going to do it this way. What do you think? It's, it's a little different than everything else. Um, and then an overall reduction in defects passed down. So which is shown in our results by increased productivity. Um, I did have um, if it's okay, Tucker, John and Sebastian, I thought they could sh share a little bit here. Yeah, please go for it. Sure. Um, so it's been mentioned a few times, but defects being significantly down really helped us hit like a, a flow state while we're working, um, which is rewarding when you're able to get through a, a high volume um, accurately. So it's nice to have like trackable, rewarding personal growth with measurable KPI results. It's, it's really great. Um, another key takeaway for me was that they're seamless in and out of the flow with clear, clearly defined roles. 
So we might need to cover for someone one day, um, but because every role is clearly defined, we know exactly what to do. Everyone that's already in the system knows what to expect from us, and it's very seamless. Um, with that in mind, it makes it great uh, for new team members to be integrated into the flow with minimal hiccups. And anytime there is like a very small thing that we all know, because we're familiar with the system, it gives us an opportunity to more clearly define a handoff, which means more clarity in the whole process. So that's great. Um, and the last note I have here is I'm really happy to see other team members who came on after us training other new team members in the flow and it's going well. So it's, it feels good. That's, That's really all I've cool. got. Uh, Sebastian, what uh, key takeaways do you have? Yeah, thanks. Um, definitely one of the bigger points, and Liz kind of had mentioned it too, is the ability to communicate, talk, talking directly with people. Uh, when you're in the flow line, it just kind of helps that communication, like building teamwork and camaraderie. Anytime that there is something that is confusing or if somebody is new and being trained, they can immediately ask a question and get an immediate response. Uh, so even though you're not necessarily doing the same work, everybody's working on the same invoices, pushing together towards completing the goal. So you actually feel like you're working as a team to accomplish this, clearing the inbox. So uh, another piece that uh, really speaks to the just the values of it is the fact that John and I were there and we've both rotated out and sometimes we'll step back in and new members of the team are grasping the process and training other members on the flow line as well. So it's that ease is just great to see. Awesome. Thank you. Really cool. Thanks, Sebastian. What I'm hearing is there's a few themes, right? And like I'm hearing definitely uh, an element of togetherness that's super important, right? It's not just, okay, firing this email off to someone, especially because to answer Diane's question, verbally here, um, we, uh, the Nordstrom team, you guys are all virtual, so you're all in your own homes. So it's, you know, there's that element too that's, a, that's at play. If you're by yourself um, sending emails, firing things over the bow to other people or, or think someone else is answering a shared inbox, like that's very different than you guys working together in flow with those three steps, processing it together. Um, very different experience, so really cool. Um, let's open up to questions uh, some, uh, a, little, uh, a little bit here. Uh, so Jay McNally um, from Seattle Children's writes in, how are you able to see whether invoices are flowing in your new process or has it become unimportant with the one day turnaround? So how are you visualizing it, I guess? is another way to say that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, so they, they're on the call and they have the emails that came in from the previous day or that morning they meet, let's say at 10 a.m. Um, and then the gatekeeper seat one looks at it and they have a flag in Outlook that they say, okay, to sort, or they could physically say it too. Um, they found this was one of the adjustments, you know, process updates <laughs> that we made, but they were physically saying, okay, this, this vendor looks good. We're sorting by date right now, or we're sorting by subject, depending on if they saw a lot from one vendor. You know, sometimes you might know, you might see a pattern. Um, and so they'd say, okay, this one's good. Well, depending on you know concentration and things, they said, hey, I think we should add a category. So it says, it really just says, okay to sort, and that's a flag, it's green, they see it, they know to move it to that next step. Um, and then they do have a folder they drag things into that says invoices stick to key. So it is visualizing with, with the folders. So that's how, how you're making it visual. If you can see, flip, good, really cool, love it. Um, Holly asked a question earlier, and it was after we had kind of moved on from, um, the uh, kind of the old way of doing things. So I, I, I decided to wait till now, but how did the team make the time to continue to do the work while working on the work slash improving it? So I think mean, this is our, our common pushback we've gotten from people who are like, yeah, improvement, continuous improvement, and you know, it's all great and I love that idea, but I just don't have time to do that. So um, can you speak to maybe how you made the time? Cause it is important as you can see. Yeah, I, you know, I can relate it, you know, you just feel like there's a lot going on and, um, you know, where do you carve it out? And I just started scheduling the meetings to be perfectly honest and said, you know, we're really focusing on this. This is important to us. We're going to these cost pass events. Um, we, there's a value in it. Um, we need to carve out the time. And so that's how it started. It was, hey, we've, we've got to go. 
Um, and then it was, hey, we're going to have this meeting. It's going to be an hour. This is what we're going to get done today. And this is what's on the agenda. We're going to map it, for example. Um, and then we'll meet, you know, next week, think about what we mapped. And then let's let's go from there. Um, and just setting that time aside and saying, hey, we're going to have this working session. Um, we're going to see the benefits down the line. And, you know, it's, I think there's um, maybe Tucker or has it, but there's a percent that Jeff and Tucker would share and it'd be like, we're, and I just, you know, share that with the team. We're going to see it. We just, we have to do the upfront work. It's going to take some time right now. Really cool. And I did not pay her to say little bit of experiments, little bit at a time, but that is, that gave me chills. That's awesome because it, I think that's the solution is instead of seeing it as like this big, oh, improving this broken process is going to take a long time. It's okay, what's our next step? What's our experiment? What, what can we run to, to learn and move the ball forward a little bit? Even if it's just like, let's meet together and just map out the current condition. Let's just show how this works. That's awesome. Because that's moving the ball forward towards improvement instead of taking the batch approach, like the Kaizen event approach of every quarter improving something slightly and then going back to your old ways. So yeah, really neat. Improve every day, right? Jay, uh, a different Jay. Could you ask, uh, talk a little more about how people were able to reduce multitasking? That is having to interrupt what they're working on to handle an emergency. So um, like kind of more S, like uh, pressing work, I guess. Yeah, so I think scheduling the time on the calendars, and I see John shaking his head too, um, is, was the biggest thing. And we started with an, you know, 30 minutes twice a day as an, as one of the items, let's say it's an, it was an experiment. Um, and we, you know, we tried that for a month almost to see like, Hey, what feedback do you guys have? Um, and they found that there were a lot of distractions happening between the two times they were meeting. And so now they actually meet for 90 minutes or, you know, 60 minutes if they finish it fully before that time. Um, and they're on that call together, they're talking, they're, um, they're holding each other accountable. I don't know if John and Sebastian have anything to add to this piece. I think a big thing is just setting aside that time to make sure you're doing the task that you're trying to do during that time. So as far as managing our other priorities, our other tasks that we were multitasking in, now that there's one sprint block, we know we're not going to interrupt it during that block. We're finishing this task. We'll schedule what we need to do before and after our, our emergency stuff around that. But um, just like during some of the tours that you showed us, uh, we're kind of red lights on. We, we got our blinders around our booth and we're just focusing on this task during that period. I was going to say to add on to that as well, when you're in the flow line uh, with just like the flow line process is so that everybody has a defined seat. So in that time that you are working in the flow line, you also know exactly what you're going to be doing. So it helps kind of hone in on the task to get meet that end goal during that uh, hour long session, 90 minute session. So kind of like you, John was saying, the horse blinders makes it very easy to focus. Yeah, and, and the, the reference there is to something behind Sarah and Matt there, which is we have actually a curtain that we, we use for our flow lines. So it's this yellow curtain we, we because we're physical, we physically move that right around our order entry flow line so we can focus on that. Um, so it's really important to have those boundaries, physically or virtually, same. We can get interrupted or, I don't know, get distracted. Humans are really distractible, uh, some more than others. Um, I'm going to put one of you on the spot um, because we are out of questions, um, though Ashley just sent one in, but I'm going to do this anyways. David, David Chan, um, you are uh, Liz's leader. So from your perspective, like I'd love to hear a little bit of it from your perspective of what you've been noticing from your from where you're sitting. Well, you know, when we uh, decided to go on this journey, we really wanted to teach the team, you know, a skill set of, of problem solving, right? I use this term, we wanted to teach them how to fish as opposed to give them fish. And I, I have found that when we talk about experiment, as we do each experiment, we get these small wins that those small wins generate a lot of momentum. I think that's what we've seen, not just with Liz's team, with two other teams as well. So we're what, year two into this? And it's been really... I mean, the numbers, and like you and Jeff always say, a minimum of 25 to 30% improvement. I mean, we're getting 80, 500% because 
it, it's the continuous commitment and effort to it. So the first time you'll get 30%, but that number will continue to grow. Yeah. And, you know, Very I would cool. say as, as a leader, not just for me, but, you know, my leader is to make that commitment to create the capacity for the team as well. So, and then once you get the success and you see the momentum pick up, it just kind of runs by itself, to be honest with you. So it's just making the commitment up front and, uh, and just watching the progress start to, to build up. From the outside looking in, it's, it's really cool because even David, your leader in Randy, the, the controller for Nordstrom, it's, he's bought in too. So it's, it's not like anyone has to sell to the, the, the top boss, like, oh, I got to do this improvement. It's his, his vision for your org is a smiley face emoji. And that's the challenge that you guys are working after. And obviously the previous process was some other emoji, probably with some red face and maybe some explicits on their mouth or something like it's not it was not not smiling and so it's kind of cool to see like that cascade down so i think that's from the outside looking and that that seems like an unlock too that has allowed you guys to be able to run with liz's team and others so i'm going to ask um ashley's question but before i oh go ahead. Uh, w w one other comment i think the other thing that was really key in the beginning is the values of nordstrom and the values of cost pass aligned really nicely, right? So that part was easy too, because Randy wants for us to have the smiley face emoji, bring joy to our work. And, and that's a cultural thing with Nordstrom, but the work that you guys are doing with CostPath uh, also is trying to bring joy to people's work, remove these obstacles. And so they can focus on the value added things, right? And not be frustrated. Yeah. So that was just the last really piece cool. I wanted to add. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you for getting put on the spot. I'm gonna put another person on the spot, but I'm gonna give you a warning because you work with me. So um, this account management team, I see like three or four of you. I'm going to ask one of you to maybe share your what you're learning or thinking through. So you guys can talk amongst yourselves while I ask Ashley's question, who's gonna be the spokesperson. I did that because I actually work with them. So like David, like I don't see you all the time so I can, you know a little bit more flippant. Um, with Ashley, uh, Ashley's question, back to the team, how have you shared these learnings with other teams within Nordstrom? So we all know we learn by teaching, super important. Um, I know that you guys have done this, so I'd love to hear maybe what you've done to share this across um, different teams within Nordstrom. Yeah, um, we've we've internally shared a bit like, hey, we do this and like this kind of different type of presentation, but sharing um, our progress and things that have worked well for us and some of the experiments. Um, we've spent some time, especially within that first three months, because um, we were so excited about the the results. Honestly, it was it's kind of hard to keep it to ourselves. Um, and then I'd say, you know, we continue to look at items and then we have some huddles where we share different items that are working or um, the other leaders in AP that they're working on and what's working and then we kind of take it back to our teams and say hey you know I heard this could this apply this is what this team's doing um, and we talk about it like that too very cool love it um, okay account management team now's your time hello okay Kelly cool Hi, Kelly. So Kelly is our account management lead uh, at Cost Taylor. She's been with us uh, for uh, just over 20 years. So she's been with us and has actually been the one to develop our version of this. So I'd love to hear, Kelly, your thoughts. As you're listening to this, what things kind of stand out to you? Um, and what are you kind of, um, what's resonating with you? Because it is different, because it's virtual, different work, but very similar process. You know, it's all, it's all very similar, though, as far as the flow of it and the seats. Um, we, just a little bit of history, we used to enter all of our purchase orders in silos, did it on our own at our desk throughout the day. Maybe it got QC'd, maybe it didn't. Uh, someone went on vacation and it just sat there on their desk, it didn't get entered. And then we have 10 different customers that send us purchase orders and you may have only known how to enter two of those customers. And now that we do it in flow, um, we do it for about one hour a day. 
multiple different people. We can enter any customer order. Someone can go on vacation. Someone can have a meeting and things don't stop. So plus we're doing it together and we do check the orders before they hit the line. So there is no defects in the line. It's good to go. And if an order is not ready, it is flagged uh, engineering. Maybe we have to go back to the customer. So it is flagged in our orders inbox um, until it's ready to go into the full line. Uh, we recently added AR, which um, we do in flow as well. It used to be a two person line. And at the end of the line, we realized we had a whole stack of things that needed to get filed. So we created it as a three person line. So now it's all completely done when we walk away. So that was good feeling as well. Uh, Jesse, you wanna add anything? Yeah, I mean, um, so yeah, my name is Jesse. I'm a member of the team. Um, <clears throat> The account management team working with Kelly and been sitting in the flow line for for seven years, I guess seven eight years. Um, and then I was um, <clears throat> kind of tasked with starting some of the other flow lines that we do, like AR, um, like Kelly mentioned, and and some of the planning updates that we do in the flow line. And um, some of the things that really resonated with me are um, just when when things are are when you have defined roles, there's there's less skill um, that you need to learn um, before you can sit in the flow line. So it's really easy to just like jump in um, if you just know how to do one sort of thing, which is nice. Um, so the onboarding process is a lot uh, faster. Um, also just like the, the, the relief of, of um, going from, from the siloed work to having a team that's kind of sharing um, it all together. Um, was really huge especially for AR for me because I learned it as one thing where I just did it um, start to finish um, and, and I didn't think of doing it in a flow line that you know I think Kelly or someone else um, said hey we we're trying to do more flow lines like we should try an accounting flow line and and so I just tried it and it's it's um it used to be like this big, like, okay, half of my day is going to be uh, sending out invoices. And now it's like, there's somebody who does the prep work that takes 20 to 30 minutes. And then we do like a 20 minute flow line um, and it's all done. And it's like, we're not uh, dreading it <laughs> every day. So um, yeah, having, uh, and, and I, yeah, I, I think some of the th things that we could, um, improve on our end um that i'm getting from the, the nordstrom folks and what they're doing is <clears throat> our, our flow starts after everything is is ready to go and i think the nordstrom has kind of implemented that um in, in it almost before things are ready um which is really cool and i think something that that we can think about on our end um as a possibility pretty cool awesome thanks jesse and kelly um, I'm going to go to the next question in the queue here. Gary is asking, it seems difficult at the beginning to identify what the issues in the process are. Uh, Liz, could you speak to how you started and uh, how you identified it, maybe identify maybe some of the causes or you know, what, are some, what were some of the issues? How did, you, how did you see the problem for what it was? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so my team works on a number of tasks daily. And so one of the things that we just, we, we started talking, hey, we're gonna look at trying to create a flow um, and thought, what does everyone know how to do on the team? Because not everyone's cross-trained on everything um, and or a majority. So let's say it's the 80-20 rule. And looking at it, it was very obvious. Everyone you know has learned a key. It's one of the first items they learn when they join the team. Um, even with John and Sebastian being so new and being four weeks in, they, they, that was one of the things they were working on daily. Um, and so it seemed a good fit to get started. Now, I didn't know necessarily there were issues with it, but then when we started mapping it, it was really hard to map. And it really highlighted some of the pain points. So we met as a team, spent that hour to get started. And I was like, hey, let's just walk through. Tell me, tell me what you're doing. You know, I think I know what you're up to, 
you know, and like the process and everything, like I can sit in, I can jump in and help, but I want to hear from you guys. And when I started putting those sticky notes, you know, and sharing my screen, it was, it was, a, there was a lot going on and um, it highlighted that there was something and that it was a good pick. Um, and then from there, we got it fully mapped. It took probably two and a half sessions and you know, they came back and said, oh, we forgot this piece. We need to add it in here and shifting items. And it was like, okay, well, great. Let's add it. Let's, we want to be really honest with ourselves. What does it look like? And then it, I was actually really surprised when I said, okay, well, let's grab a red sticky. You know, you guys all get a vote, put where you feel you're just feeling the pain. You may have not been, some of these folks don't enter invoices daily. They learned it, but they haven't, they don't do it regularly. They might've been part of the surge resources sometimes. And they all, a lot of them, I would say 80% put it on the keying part, you know, and feeling the defects there and how they couldn't get it keyed. And it was frustrating. Like, why did I even get this work on my desk if it can't be entered? Um, and so I would say that's how we, proceeded with that and kind of tried to get it orderly orderly a little bit um but then after we implemented some changes you also felt it when we went to remap it and say okay here's our process that we had i'm just going to show everyone and then you know we made some updates you know we're continuously looking at it but let's just map it um it was a lot easier to map it was way more clear on what and everyone had you know they're like oh it was this xyz you know suggestions because we had defined it too. That's really cool to hear. Um, I didn't know the answer to that question. I was really intrigued by the um, prospect of hearing it. Um, grasping the current condition, you know, for those that have some CADA background, CADA, CADA background, grasping the current condition is the first thing you do after you identify the challenge, right? And so I, what I'm hearing is even though you weren't using Toyota CADA, you were using the, um, let's understand how it's currently working and, and do a block diagram or sticky notes or whatever to understand that. Um, and I love what you said. It was really hard because it, it was really confusing. It was, it was probably, probably multiple people did it different ways and there wasn't like really a, a good way of doing it. Um, that exercise has been really killer. I've seen that um, many in many places that that works. So I think that, that could be a good takeaway for some of you is, is just process map it out. Um, I find for myself, whenever I run into that at cost where there's some weird uh, like outcome that we're like, this sucks, I hate this, this process is not good. Um, it's usually, we can't even draw it. And it, we ca it takes us five minutes to agree with like, what's the, even the first step. And, and like, it's, it's, there's something powerful with going through the exercise of just let's actually like draw it out. And it doesn't have to be, like sticky notes are not very high tech. It's not like an IT solution, it's just let's draw it out and see what we learn. So really cool, that, that's cool that was part of your process. Um, Nick asked the question, so he's the individual that's working on doing this for our AP process. So one challenge that we've run into is some things need to be handled by other departments, so maybe purchasing, HR, right, other people make transactions and stuff like that. So um, uh, yeah, before you can proceed with the entry process, how have you reduced the waiting time for your invoices that require outside help? So maybe speak to that. Yeah, um, so we're focusing on the merchandise invoices, but I think a pr part of that is um, we have something where the buyer has to flip something on their end sometimes, and we see those, so that would relate to this. Um, and they have a process where they send it off to that contact, and they, pu they put it in one of the folders, but it's very clearly defined on what the actions need to happen now, um, and then they circle back. And that in that when the buyer replies, it'll come back in the inbox and they'll see that they has a certain subject line as well. So it'll flag it for them and say, oh, OK, it needs to go in this folder. And then they do a sweep of it. Um, and then if they haven't gotten a response so that waiting time, then they have a cadence now um, that they're supposed to follow up and say, hi, second follow up. And that's really helped that waiting time. Really cool. Nick, does that answer your question? Yeah, that was really helpful. I think from what I heard, part of it is you try to, within your flow line, handle less of the exceptions so that you don't have those interruptions as much and maybe handle the exceptions in a different way. Yeah, that's really good. And that's like, that's a good micro learning that goes beyond just this process, right? Like if we ha introduce defects into the line, um, whether it's order entry, 
manufacturing, wh whatever, like that's, that's not good because then it's going to cause people to stop. Flow is working, you know, start to finish without ceasing and without, you know, running into problems and bottlenecks and defects and that sort of thing. So, yeah, great question, Nick. Um, Anthony asked a question, was IT involved with the pro solution or I'll just bring it to maybe even just any, was there any external teams involved with the solution or, or was this just you guys working together? It was just our team. So different people took different pieces of it. And so like um, May, my business analyst, she she was like, hey, I'm going to make it take a stab at doing the decision tree. You know, and um, it kind of once the emails received by the team, it it really just it falls onto our team to figure out what's going on with it. Um, so we didn't have to rely on other business partners for this piece. Yeah. Can I can I add to that too? Please, I think please. in in our approach to not only this project but other projects that we've done uh, on our other teams was to try to focus on what we could control and and improve it to the best to our ability. So that was one of the key requirements because knowing if we got other teams involved, whether it's product management or our engineering team, it would take a lot longer. And those just have a longer lead time to get things done. So we said, let's focus, look in the mirror, let's focus on what we could do and make it the best that it can be. And, you know, it's always a good approach, right? When we're solving a problem. So that that's worked well and it's, it has served the team well too. Yeah, and there there is a time to solve things with other teams for sure. But like you said, it's, it, it was something you guys could fix and get that benefit right away without involving other people. It's, it's oftentimes easier to start there. Um, so it's a great question, Anthony. Um, okay, uh, this will be the last question. A boss uh, is actually a CAS alum. He worked here as in our IT team actually for a, a while. We actually have a couple CAS alums on the call. You know who you are. Um, I really saw value in cross-training uh, at my time in CAS, uh, with my time in CAS, um, and it's something I insist on at multiple engagements since CAS. It is a challenge to get buy-in from stakeholders who feel threatened by the exercise. Did you face this challenge and how did you overcome it? Great question. Um, are you, I just want to make sure I understand the question. So training and the cross-training, so cross-training on this flow line or on the like concepts and things like that? Cross-training on the flow lines. On the flow lines. That I, um, yeah, so the team is really receptive to that. Um, they, they rotate through the different seats. So they may sit in a seat for, you know, two weeks or a month, depending on items. We're doing a month right now. Um, and we've, we've had some new folks join too. So they, we, ha we have the seats ranked in where they should start and then where they should go next. Um, and so we have about half of our team is trained on this flow line, I would say. Um, so if someone also is out, they see the value, like everyone wants to take a day off and feel like they're not going to come back to something sitting on their desk or, you know, have an issue and, and that sort of thing. It makes it that much easier to, to coordinate your, your time off. Um, if you're like, Hey, John, John's going to cover my seat today. He's not normally in the flow, but he's going to be able to move um, items around on his desk and cover me while I'm in Hawaii or something like that. Um, Sebastian mm -hmm. too, like, let's say someone's sick and he's like, hey, I can jump in. I have bandwidth for today. And because the work is getting done um, that same day too, it's not sitting on their desks, even though they jumped in. So that's also, they see the value in the cross training because they see how it affects their peers. That's really cool. Yeah, what I'm hearing then is really identifying some motivating factors, right, for an individual to want to do that, I think um, is a good takeaway. And I've heard that from Kelly and team when they teach our flow line. It was, yeah, when I went on vacation, I knew orders were stacking up and it was really stressful. And then coming back was the worst. And so tying it to something that the, the, individual, the individual cares about um, and getting them a chance to see cross training be an effective experience is maybe the counsel I'd give a boss um, but it, it can be really hard because it can be threatening I think um, you know with with like uh, what we ha have going on in the world with you know layoffs and 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 efficient you know efficiency things I think that can be really it can definitely be a challenge because people might think oh if I am not the only one that can do this then 
my security is threatened. And so um, I know with, with your team and with our team, we've been very clear, like this is not to reduce headcount, it's so that we can be more flexible. And the people that are here can have more joy. But I think a lot of people have maybe some, I'd call it trauma, where it's, they're used to having bad experiences when there's cross training perhaps. So you know, I'd understand maybe what's causing that fear, and then also what, what motivations can we have and play, you know, and, and satisfy some of those extrinsic and intrinsic motivations so that someone's like, yeah, why would I not cross train? You know, um, so really cool. Well, thank you so much for joining uh, today. I'm gonna put into the chat, but I'm also gonna share my screen. So thank you for joining. Um, we have a couple things, uh, ways to engage further. So um, we just made this live like literally uh, this morning. And we have an open house where if anyone wants to visit us um, and come hang out, uh, there's a, a link in the chat you can come visit for one of two time slots on April 11th, where we'll show you around, we'll show you some of the tools we use, um, get to know you. It'd be especially good to maybe come with a colleague, especially someone that's actually, could actually help lead a transformation. That's kind of the intent of this time. And then if you wanna hear more about CostPass, it's on our site, take a look. Uh, we're, we're here to help organizations go through this transformation much like Nordstrom is doing. And then for those that are in the community already, we have some events coming up. Um, some Q&Rs and some waste tours um, to sign up for. So with that, thank you so much, Liz, Sebastian, and John. Can we give them a, a, a silent uh, round of applause, you know, the Zoom waving thing, um, ASL. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing what you guys have learned. It's been really impactful for, I know, for me and Jeff and others. Um, so yeah, with that, have a great weekend and see you later. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Hi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.